Yes. Come on, City Hope. Wow, what a year. It was exciting. So many things happened. I want to welcome you to the most exciting weekend of this year. And it's the weekend, uh, the first of the year, we call Vision Weekend. And I'm going to share several things with you. And so it's a little different format of teaching and, and sharing, but there's some things I want to share with you. And, and I, w I want you to understand this, that we're doing this to give thanks and honor to God. First, he accomplished all the things you're going to hear uh, through us as people, and I want to give thanks to you, the church, for doing all that you do, serving, giving, all of the things that you've been part of, praying and, and leading. Thank you so much that you're helping make our vision become a reality. The title of this message, Hope Rising, and I want to lift your expectation of what is possible, the future, yourself, the church, even your expectations of God. You see, new expectations fuel our efforts so we can put a plan into action. And old expectations where they're like zombies that refuse to die, and they must die before new expectations can replace them. The ideal of this message will move us to expect City Hope, by God's grace and power, to fulfill the vision God has entrusted us with. And in doing that, here's what happens, the vision of your house will be accomplished also. The vision of City Hope is this, and you know it, but let's, let's read it again. To lead people to become fully alive in the true hope of Christ. For this to happen, we need hope rising. Expectation is not the same as a wish for the future. An expectation is an anticipated future that shapes today's decisions. An expectation is an anticipated future that shapes today's decisions. Wishful thinking is a fantasy. Optimism is just mere attitude. But expectations, on the other hand, are probable, seemingly inevitable scenarios for our futures. And expectations provides a scaffold for us in our decision making. So high, high expectations, are, are, they, they innovate. And high expectations, they persevere. And high expectations don't quit until they're finished. And there is one institution on the face of the earth with the capacity, the presence, the credibility, the endurance, and the passion to perform the ultimate act of loving and caring for people enough to become fully alive in the hope of Christ. And that is the church, the body of Christ, and that's who you are. You are the church. You're the body of Christ. So instead of us looking at the negatives of the culture and society and all the things going on in our world and even declining church organizations, we need to realize that hope is rising throughout the world. And we must understand who we are and that our faith rests in what Jesus said. He said, upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. If we base our expectations off the conditions that we think are here, about our world, then we will not have expectations to believe hope is rising. God will extend his love to people now. In the midst of everything that's going on, God wants to extend his love to people now, but we're the carriers of that love. We're the ones who bring that hope, and if we don't have expectations to believe that our world can change, then it won't. So with our hope, we believe it can change. Without hope, we believe the lie that whispers, you can't make a difference. Look, look at all of what's going on. You, you can't make a difference. You, you don't matter. It just, it, it, it's just not going to get any better. It's going to be this way. But what institution carries the truth that defeats that lie? Who declares that you do matter? And if you, and if you can get better, it's because God really does love you and wants to bless you so you can be a blessing to a hopeless world. Who proclaims the message that with God... All things are possible. It's the church. Does that look like our church? Does that sound like City Hope? Is City Hope a carrier of hope? Do we have expectations of seeing hope rising? Yes, we do, and yes, we are. Let me explain to you what I see in my heart. Well, a little different perspective. From birthing this church almost 18 years ago, I see things a little different sometimes. And here, here's how I see the church. I see last year as a year of crossing through. We're crossing through into our promise, into our destiny. 
We've been on the journey for 17 years, and, and I believe that through all the years of trying and learning and trials and changing and tweaking and, and, and through all the wondering and the pressing and all of the wilderness and all the things that we've done, I really believe the name change last year set that in motion that we crossed through and now we're in our promise. If you go back to the story in Joshua when the children of Israel were crossing through to their destiny, their promise, the Jordan was at flood stage and God held up the water so they went through on dry ground to get to the other side. They were crossing through to their destiny. And we definitely have seen this in this church and we've seen this in your lives. But anytime we're crossing through, it means we're taking ground and if we're advancing a position so City Hope, we, we are in an advancing mode. We're taking ground. We're in an advancing position. So if you advance and take ground, you're going to find enemies because the enemy doesn't want to give up your promise very easily because the enemy is squatting in your promise. And, and so we have to drive the enemy, enemy off of our promise. And the first battle the children of Israel had to face after they crossed through the, to the promise, they faced the walls of Jericho. They reached their promise, but now they're facing this enormous wall. So what do we do when we're trying to take our promises? Because you're hearing me say one thing, but the world that you live in, this, the, the, maybe even your personal life, you're saying, well, there's a wall there. How, how, do we do, how do we take our promises? Well, by being faithful in everything he asks us to do. But when, even when we do that, we're going to find enemies, and then we're going to have challenges, and then we're going to get frustrated or discouraged. Why? Because we're facing a wall. We're looking at a wall, and we don't know how to get past it. They crossed over the Jordan at the flood stage, and that means it was a raging river. They could not go back. Their back was against the river. And so here they come in, the back's against the river. You can't go back, and they're facing the most fortified city in the land, the most difficult challenge they have ever faced. And so God puts them in this situation. He puts them in a place, it's a stuck situation. And he loves, he, he loves to get us right up against the wall. He loves to put us right up against the wall. Our back's not to the wall, but our face is to the wall, and there's nothing left to do when you face the wall except trust in him. And God did this to these people on purpose. God arranged each and every detail to make sure that there was an impossible situation. And then he took this young leader, Joshua, who was at a loss of what to do. And, 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 and maybe, maybe Joshua was trying to figure, out it, figure it out on his own. And he, he runs into this stranger and it appears to him. And, and, and he's a well-dressed warrior standing in front of Joshua. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Joshua and Jesus have a conversation. And then the Lord gives him this incredible military advice. Now Joshua's all, already been thinking because there were three primary principles the military used to take down a fortress, and he's already thinking about those. How that, how's that going to happen? He's probably already scouted it out, trying to figure it out. But God simply said, you're going to walk around the wall once each day for six days, and on the seventh day you're going to walk around it seven times, and then you're going to shout at the wall. In South Alabama we would say yell at the wall. You're going to shout at the wall, and the wall's going to come down. And Joshua's look on his face was probably, huh? That, that, that's not in the book. That, that, that's not in the military strategy book. But Joshua heard what the Lord said, believed what he said. He goes back to his leaders, and the Lord has shown me this plan. And I'm sure the leader's thinking, this is crazy. This is not going to work. But Joshua led it. They did it. It worked. God's plan worked. The walls fell. They walked in and took the city. Listen to me. We are in our promised land. Time is short. God's heart is, is, is throbbing for lost people in a world. We are in our promised land, and we are facing a wall. I don't know what your wall is. I, I, I know what my wall is. I don't know what your, your wall is going on, but I want you to know this, that when we're facing the wall, the most important thing we can do is hear God and obey God. You say, well, that's so simple. No, it's meant that way. When we face a difficult challenge, when life throws us something we're not expecting, I've never seen this kind of problem. I don't know what to do with this problem. We've got to go to God and hear God and do what he says. Because listen, the bottom line of all of this, please ca catch this, the bottom line of all this is at the end of the day, at the end of your days, all God needs is our obedience. That's what he needs, our obedience. 
When we obey, God is able to take care of everything else that stands in our path. That wall can just disappear when we obey. When we stand in God and execute what he's told us to do, we can know that he is responsible for the outcome. And here's what God wants me to share with you. God wants you to know you're not responsible for the outcome. I am, he says. But it's yours for the taking. The outcome is yours for the taking. He, he said to me, you may be, this is what the Lord is saying to me in my heart, not audible, I'm, I don't hear that, I just hear it in my heart. You are leading the people of City Hope, but I'm their God. And you hear me and you execute the plan, but I'm the one who has to make it happen. So tell them to trust me and do what I tell them to do, do what my word says, and the wall will come down, and they will live and operate in the promise in the, in the, in the time that we live in with all the chaos and all the You will live in my promises if you will hear me and obey me. And, and that's good news, right? That's good news. So here's what I want to do for the rest of the message. I want to show you why we do the things we do. And secondly, I want to show you where we're going. So in in one scripture today is John 21, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him again the second time, son, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So watch, the first thing was feed my lambs. Then he said, tend my sheep. And thirdly, he said, feed my sheep. So I'm going to take that in reverse order. I'm going to end up with the number one thing Jesus said to do. Feed my sheep. Listen, this is what drives me as your pastor is to feed people, to feed you. If I feed God's people, we can change the world. Why? Because if people know the Word of God and have faith in the Word of God, we can change the world. How do we change the world? We reach lost people. Well, how can that happen? Because if I feed you healthy food, the Word of God, we produce healthy sheep, and healthy sheep will reproduce. And and let let me say this. Let let me tell you how we feed sheep here. And I have to say thank you for allowing me to do this because I I, I know in our culture and where we live, we're we're kind of a little out of of sync on some of the mainline things. We're not as advanced sometimes as the cities and different parts of the country. So we may be behind the curve a little bit, but let me say thank you because we feed sheep here by having 15 services every weekend at seven campuses. And thank you that I don't have to preach all of them live. (laughs) Only three. (laughs) There's no way we can feed sheep without streaming the message. And many of you right now in Mobile and Foley and Baymanette and Holman, you see me on a screen rather than in person. Thank you for understanding that the Holy Spirit can speak through God's Word from a screen because there's no way I could do that live. And by the way, the Saturday night service was offered here for eight years. And after shifting in the fall to the Sunday evening, I realized how much a Saturday off meant. (laughs) And I realized how important it was to our staff who are young and they have children and activities and and they get here at 12 or 1 on a Saturday. So after praying and, and, and hearing and believing that we do need that day off, I have decided we will not go back to Saturday evening services at this time. But for your information, just so you know that I'm not wimping out, for five years we had five services at Malbus, two Saturday, three Sunday. I preach all of them live. It's before, multi, it's before campuses. It's before the streaming. And, and, and we, we only had 500 seats, so we had to accommodate a lot of people. And, and, I, and, and I nearly wore myself out doing that. I look back now, and I realize I was leading on empty. And that's not a good place. That's not good for our church. So I had to decide to guard that. And, and, and listen, church hasn't changed. Our vision hasn't changed. But technology has changed our world. Now, I don't know about you, but we'll see how many people can understand this. When I grew up, we had a black and white TV. How many of you had a black and white TV? Look at the old people. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the case was black and white. I'm talking about the screen was black and white, okay? And, and I don't know about you, but we had three channels. Three channels. And I was the remote control. 
Son, turn it to five. Son, turn it to ten. You know, okay? I, I, I know things have changed, and I appreciate you allowing the church to change and grow with it. L- l- let me tell you how, how ad- awesome you are as people. I want you to look at this number. At our campuses last year, we had over 1,200 volunteers serving in the commons, in the parking lot, and in the worship centers serving people. Thank you for serving. And I believe you need to serve to stay healthy, church. Now, the second thing Jesus said, tend my sheep. The word tend means to herd. So I'm herding sheep according to the Bible. Sometimes I feel like I'm herding cats, but it's sheep. The root word tend is the word shepherd. So I'm shepherding. God called me to shepherd. What does that mean? That means he's called me to lead and to feed, to lead and to feed. The result of that is you will see hope rising in your personal lives. So what we have done over the years, we we now call it life development classes. Formerly, it was equipping classes. So we have life development classes, classes on marriage, how to have a strong, healthy marriage, on your finances, on parenting, on the Holy Spirit, on prayer. And we even have the basic class for if you're a new believer. So we even have a whole department called Freedom Ministry, a five-week course dealing with the issues that keep you from being fully alive. Last year, we had 130 people complete that. And I want to say to you, thank you, because most people don't complete it. Most people start and stop. And thank you for completing that. We we also have our our ministry for ladies and men. We, we, We are in the fourth year of City Hope College, which is designed to equip those who are young, being called into ministry. We also have the community school that operates here at Malbus with over 100 students in the school that goes from K-4 through 5. And so we're tending and we're shepherding people and children and, and we're doing all of these things. So let me get to the number one thing Jesus said. He said, feed my lambs. The first thing he said was feed lambs, not sheep. In the Greek, it means little lambs, but the direct translation implies helplessness. Feed the ones that are helpless. This represents new people coming to the Lord. It represents people who may know the Lord, but they haven't grown yet, and they're still in that infancy stage. And our job is to feed lambs because we always want to see people accept Christ. We want them to change their life. We want them to find the true hope. Now, this next number I'm going to show you, just so you know, is recorded in heaven. This one's in heaven. In our children's ministry in our church, Kid City, 200 children accepted Christ last year. In student ministries, 190 youth accepted Christ last year. Almost 1,200 adults accepted Christ, and 440 of them were baptized. Our China China campus had 150 people make decisions, and 42 were baptized. The Honduras campus saw over 90 people accept Christ. Now, this this is the one that gets me. This is the one that grabs my heart the most. Because for 17 years, we've been saying the way we reach people is we reach out and we do random acts of kindness with no strings attached. We love people, and then we take it to another level and we serve people who don't even know us. Last year, that's our plan to reach people, is to random acts of kindness. That's our evangelism plan, okay? So last year we had over 3,400 people serve over 38,000 people in our community. You did an incredible job. That's over 16,000 hours of serving people in our community. In China, our people served over 1,500 hours, and I have to be careful what to give you information on what they serve there, as you understand. Honduras, they serve uh, 1,200 hospital meals. They've taken in and adopted 35 children at an orphanage. They did outreach to schools, to high schools, over 3,000 kids in one, and just on and on and on. And here's another number to look at. Last year, our budget, we, we estimate budget based on your giving. And, and last year, you met that, but you exceeded it by 8%. You, you gave... more than what we budgeted. By studying other life-giving churches, the elders 
we have decided to create our budget in a different way starting this year. And the years past, it was uh, kind of a projection. We had this growth, so we're going to project this growth, and sometimes we'd hit it, sometimes we wouldn't. But here's, here's what we're doing this year. This year, we're creating our budget for this year by taking 90% of the income of last year, and that's our budget. So in doing this, with this strategy, it will give us a surplus of the 10 plus whatever you give above what we, what, what that, whatever you give above that, and we will take those numbers and we're using that for debt reduction and future campus development. So those funds, we're going to operate. It's going to be a tough year for us because now we're going to back up a little bit, but we're going to operate around this 90%, and we're going to take the other and we're going to put it in against our debt and we're going to put it in toward campus development. And by the way, just for your information, about six years ago, 22% of City Hope people tithe, and today it's 30%. Thank you. And that is an incredible number because the average in the United States is a single-digit number. And the church with the strongest percentage of tithers is just over 50%. We're not at 50% yet, but we're on our way. China campus had an increase in attendance of 119%, and giving went up 148%. Honduras had an increase. Yeah, Honduras had an increase in attendance of 144%, and giving went up 134%. Here's another number you may not be aware of. We have always given our tithe to missions and ministries out of what you do. It has always been set at a minimum it is of 10%. It's always above that. We practice what we ask you to do. So last year, we gave almost $1.1 million to missions and to ministries. <laughs> that equates to 14%. In the States at our campuses, we recognize and minister to about 5,000 people at City Hope Church. Our online campus has around 500 computers, but that doesn't tell us for sure how many people, because in the other countries, it's not one person, it could be many. They're watching our online stream of services. Let me tell you the top 10 countries, Brazil, Honduras, Russia, Uruguay, China, Netherlands, Canada, Italy, the UK, and Japan. So. Those, that, those cameras that you see here and those people in the control room and the control room and all of those people operating all that, we're doing that to feed people all around the world. That's awesome. In 2015, we had some incredible projects that we needed to complete, and because many of you gave above and beyond your tithe, we call that offerings or extravagant giving, we were able to one, finish camp, the campus at Malvis, new building that, we, that we've been praying for and believing for for many years. Two, remodel the old building for Kid City. Three, we've enlarged the parking lot because everybody in your family drives a car to church. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> we, don't, we don't go by the city code that says, oh, you're going to have this many. No, everybody brings one. Okay. So, uh, we remodeled the Baymanette campus. We equipped the Holman campus, which means we put in all the gear and the lights for the, for the DVD and the sound and all that. We equipped that there. Number six, we leased space and built out the admin and student complex at the Mobile campus. We leased out space and built out the campus in China. We leased out space and built out the campus in Honduras. Because of your tithing and giving above the offerings, we're able to accomplish these projects. So, thank you. Now, go ahead. So here's the, I know when you're my, here's where you are, so I'm trying to hurry to get to this. What are our expectations in 2016? What are our expectations? In other words, where do we want to go? Where do we want to plant? Well, let me share that with you. Number one, we expect to plant a campus in North Mobile, a city called Saraland. We're looking for a land or a building to lease. Hopefully in the fall, the campus will begin. We'll keep you informed, but be praying for us that the doors will open. Secondly, we expect to adopt another church. This church is located in the Netherlands. We've started the process. It'll take several months to work out the details, and we believe in the fall the adoption can take place of this church around seven, 800 people, and we'll keep you informed, but be praying for this campus, okay? So what are the project expectations of 2016? In other words, what do we want to build? First, we want 
to, we expect to build phase one of Foley Campus. Now, now, I wasn't pausing for you to clap. I was pausing to see if I could hear Foley down there screaming and yelling right now. <laughs> we have 15 acres of land there. We're going to build the first building so we can make a transition from the middle school. The middle school has been a phenomenal facility. The principal there has been a, just a great asset to us. But we'll keep you informed about this. Keep praying for it. Number two, we expect to build a chapel. We will take part of the old worship center at Malvis and build a chapel. The chapel will serve for weddings, funerals, and overflow if needed. The chapel will be a very, very special place for special events. We'll keep you informed. Number three, we expect to build a camp. A dream that I had almost forgotten awakened in me a couple years ago when I pulled up on a rented campsite with one of our pastors, and I remembered the dream, the dream for our church to have its own camp and retreat center. This year, with God's help, we will build Camp Hope. We have already purchased the land, 80 acres, and it's about 20 minutes southeast of the Malvis campus. It is a beautiful piece of property. It has a, a creek going through it and all this good stuff. It will serve our youth and our children in part of it in phase one, which will really be a cool place with a lake and the blog and all that stuff they love to do. And it will also serve adults as well because part of the plan is to build cabins or housing for adults because we want to have ongoing marriage retreats, single retreats, men retreats, women retreats, and even our volunteers need a rest. And so we're going to build this place so that we can reach our people in-house that are doing so much and reach your children. Now, here's what I felt God saying to me last year before the land even became available. Here's what he said. I want this year that this retreat, this campsite, to be a priority of the church. He said, you're doing well in serving all the other places that I'm showing you to serve, but I want you to focus on City Hope I want you to focus on the generations to come, the children, the youth, and the marriages of this house. I want you to feed them and tend to them and lead them from a very special environment so that we are building up the future generations of this house. And then God said also to me, the vision of this house, of City Hope Church, cannot be completed with just the existing generations you are not a one-generational church, and I want a group of people coming up that are not going to wander in the wilderness, but they are going to be birthed in the promise and raised in the promise that I have given you as a church. And these families and teens and children will help you complete the vision of this house, and with this expectation, you will not lose them. <laughs> My desire as a pastor is to help you and your family reach your promise, your, your destiny. And, and God is call, has a calling for you on the earth. Nothing can stop us from advancing the kingdom of God on earth when we all know our calling, our purpose, our plan. We'll come back to you later with a master plan. I want all families involved in the funding and the building of the camp. And I believe families can invest in the legacy of faith in their children and the children's children. Be praying for this. This is huge. This is on the top of my radar. So why are we expanding again? Why are we taking on new projects? Why are we going and planting here and there? Why are we building or spending money, as some of you would think? Hope's rising. What's, the hope, what, what's rising? The true hope for people. You see, God loves people, and we love to help people. And every number you've heard, watch, has a name attached to it. And every name has a story attached to it. When we were building this building in the footings, we, had, we put stones in and we passed out stones. We were in the old worship center and you, put on, you wrote down names of loved ones and family members you wanted to see come to Christ. And we put those in the foundations and they're there, buried under the concrete. Many of you have already told stories of your loved ones coming to Christ, and many of you are still believing and praying and having faith that the, ones, that the other ones are, are also going to do so. 
You see, I believe the greatest story of this church will not be the ones in other countries or missionaries or ministries that we support and love. I believe the greatest stories will come from grandparents and parents that will share how their children are living in the promise of God in the midst of chaos and confusion, that their children live in the promises of God because the people of this church face the wall and refused to give up the future generations of this church and this house and we obeyed what the Lord said and God will give us victory in our homes. Listen, true vision is generational. That's why we're not a one generational church. True vision is generational. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you have the Abrahams in the house and you have the Isaacs in the house and you have the Jacobs in the house, you will complete and accomplish your vision. But for this to happen, hope has to be rising. And remember, an expectation is an anticipated future that shapes today's decisions. Expectations are probable, seemingly inevitable scenarios for our future. High expectations innovate. High expectations persevere. High expectations don't quit until they're satisfied. So as, as a bottom line report to you for our church, about our church, City Hope Church, we are fully alive with expectation that hope is rising. And if you agree with that, I want you to shout amen. amen. That's good. I would like for you to stand. I don't want you to leave the room yet. We're almost finished. But I want to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you to do something that may be a little uncomfortable because you may be sitting beside some weird person. But, but I want you to take hands with the people on your row. Okay? Just on your row, just take hands. And I don't want to pray for you. Because, because I, I want to tell you something. All of this that God has done and wants to do, it requires that we have faith in what he says to do, and we do it. It's that simple. The hard part is him. He, in fact, we can't do it. He has to do it. So I want us to join hands at the campuses. I want us to connect hands. And as a family of believers, I want to pray for you that this year, you will see the blessings of God overtake your home and those blessings will so motivate you that you can't wait to serve and bless other people in your house, your community, and on the other side of the world. Father, thank you for sending your son to us, for dying for us, and thank you, Lord, for the covenant you've made with him. And because we're sons and daughters, we get to be part of that. And Lord, we have stepped into the promise. We've stepped into a place of living and existing in the destiny you have planned for us as a church and individual homes. So Lord, I pray that you will show us and teach us how to hear you, hear you and to obey you and have faith in what you say. And in doing that, Lord, in the midst of everything else that's going on, we will walk in a place of high expectations that our God is not finished with this world and he wants to use us to change it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Can I do one more thing? Can I kind of get a little edgy for just a minute? I know it's Vision Sunday. I'll be honest with you, I'm surprised you came back because after the first Sunday of the year, last week I talked on tithing, so I'm surprised you came back. It's like, <laughs> wow, y'all came back. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But listen, and I didn't plan to do this, the, the first service right about this time, the Lord kind of pressed me to do this. But I believe the Lord is speaking to some, and you're not sure, or maybe you do know that you don't have that true hope. And all the numbers and all the stuff you've seen, you may think, well, that's a brag sheet. 
But really what God is doing, he's trying to show you how faithful he can be and that your problems to him are very small and very manageable. To you, they're large. But because of doubt and the lack of faith, you're just kind of standing on the sideline and Jesus isn't Lord of your life. And he's saying to you, what a day for you to come to Christ on Vision Sunday and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior so that you can walk into and live out your destiny and your promise now and not wait till later. So I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. I'm going to ask you very quickly, if that's you, if what I just said by the Spirit, if that's you, I just want you to be honest at the campuses and here, just, just lift your hand up. You, you want to make sure that you know. You, you want to make sure hands are going up. I'm sure there are hands going up at the other campuses. Let, let's all, with our heads bowed, eyes closed, let's all pray this prayer together, okay? Everybody, let's pray it out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us, for giving your life for us, and giving us promises. And we want to know you and to love you. And we invite you into our lives. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and become Lord of our lives. Become Lord of my promise. Become Lord of my destiny. In Jesus' name, I thank you that I have true hope. Amen. Can we give the Lord just a great big applause? God bless you.